Hi everyone, so in this lecture we'll discuss again the roots of the ordinary world while our last video looked at um, overt behaviors, you know, physically what you do in the world, how you behave in the world. Uh, now we're take a look at covert behaviors, you know, your, your, the way you see things, the way you perceive things, your beliefs. Why is it that they're so ingrained and hard to question? Hard, how, how, how we get so caught in our caves that we never question a certain, a certain assumption that we have about how something is supposed to be or how things are supposed to look like. You know, think about your approaches to various artistic endeavors. You, know, you have a perception of what good song, what a good song is supposed to sound like, or you have an idea in your head about what a good painting is supposed to look like, or you know, what a good story is supposed to be like, or you have a belief about what a good life is supposed to be like. So those are covert, right? You can't see those because they're in your head. How does it come about? How does it, how does it have such hold on us? So last class was about the overt behaviors, and this lesson will be about those thoughts and perceptions. Okay? So to begin, let's have another creative mind spotlight, this time on Chinese philosopher Zhuang Zi. Zhuang Zi was a... Um, is most closely associated with what's referred to as Taoism. And uh, he's a fourth century BCE Chinese philosopher, so a contemporary of Plato's, which means they were alive around the same time. And um, what I'm about to show you is an excerpt of one of Zhuang Zi's writings. And this should give you a theme that sounds very familiar to what we've been talking about for the past few lectures. Uh, this is often referred to as the butterfly dream. Okay, so Zhuangzi writes, Once upon a time I, Zhuangzi, dreamt I was a butterfly, fluttering hither and thither, to all intents and purposes, a butterfly. I was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was Zhuangzi. Soon I awakened, and there I was, veritably myself again. Now I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly, dreaming I am a man. Between a man and a butterfly, there is necessarily a distinction. The transition is called the transformation of material things. What is this about? Have you ever felt this way? You ever wondered whether or not what you're experiencing right now is just a dream? You ever have you ever been in a dream and felt like it was very real? So real that you didn't even, that, that you, you had this, this deep sense that this is what life was, right? Whatever it is you were experiencing in the dream. Philosophically, have you ever questioned this? Questioned whether or not this life is, you know, the real world. In a more generic sense, we see Zhuang Zi here doing what we saw Plato doing in his allegory of the cave, right? It's about questioning your reality. How do you know your reality is the real one? How do you know your beliefs about life, your beliefs about art, your beliefs about music, your beliefs about writing, your beliefs about success, your beliefs about how to deal with family members? How do you know that that's the right ones? Let's take a look at another excerpt from Zhuang Zi's writings. There will be a great awakening, and only then shall we know the great dream that all this is. Yet the ignorant are sure that they're awake, sure as sure can be. This one's a ruler, that one's a shepherd. They're absolutely certain of it. Okay, so I'll give you some context for this. So there was a student, I believe a student who comes to Zhuang Zi, saying, um, asking Zhuang Zi about a certain claim. That the student believed in. And he was trying to get Zhuang Zi to acknowledge that this that the student had a, a correct claim. I, the student would say, you know, I believe this is true. And this is Zhuang Zi's response to the student trying to prod Zhuang Zi into acknowledging that the student had a claim that was true. Okay? And this is what Zhuang Zi tells him. There will come a great awakening, and only then shall we know the great dream that all this is, yet the ignorant are sure that they're awake, sure as sure can be. So think back to our ordinary world, how many of us get so caught up in our ordinary world thinking we know, you know, what the right approach to, uh, 
to a painting is or, or the writer approach to writing a good song is or what it's supposed to sound like or for that matter what the paper airplane is supposed to look like how sure are we of that right these are, these are all the assumptions and beliefs that dictate and define our ordinary world and so long as he says well how do you know right how do you know and this is the big problem with the ordinary world is that we think we know reality when we're completely trapped in it we believe we got it right we believe we understand how everything works what the right thing is the wrong thing is the correct way the incorrect way and as a result we get stuck into patterns of behavior and approaches to problems that may not really work right because you think no this is the i have the right idea in my head of how to deal with this issue Maybe you're dealing with an issue with your kid or with your boss or with schoolwork. And maybe there was an approach to those things that had worked for you in the past. So then you continually do them, right? You have this belief that that's the right approach. Because in the ordinary world, you think you got it, right? You think you know it. And as we noticed with the paper airplane exercise, maybe we don't really know <laughs> what a paper airplane is supposed to look like. Maybe we don't really know what a glue stick is used for. But thinking we do know it causes us to limit ourselves, doesn't it? Thinking we do know causes us to have a narrow sense of meaning. Remember our definition of creative blocks. But it's just natural, right? When you're caught up in that ordinary world, it feels as if you know reality. Think about Truman. When he was stuck in his ordinary world, he never questioned whether or not this was a television set. He never questioned whether or not his wife really loved him. He never questioned whether or not that, that his mom was really his mom. He, he thought he knew reality. That's what the ordinary world is like. And as you notice, probably this can cause issues uh, when we all believe we know things and there are different beliefs. Right? This can lead to arguments, which can then lead to conflicts, which can lead to things even worse than that when we think we know reality. So my, my goal within this lecture is to show you that we don't. <laughs> my goal within this lecture is to talk to you about how our experience of reality works and to show you that we don't really know reality. And then once we realize that, maybe we can open ourselves up to leaving our ordinary worlds behind. Yeah? So the big idea then is that we don't experience reality as it is. We experience reality based on how we are unconsciously conditioned to experience it. And the two factors that contribute to our experience of reality are our sensations. Okay, that's one. Sensations refer to uh, the process of detecting physical energies with our sensory organs. So for example, there is a sensory, there's this physical energy called light around us. And then my sensory organ called the eye is able to detect that light. Right? There are chemicals that I put into my mouth every once in a while, right? And then my tongue can detect those physical energies and say, that's salty, <laughs> right? That's sour. Um, I can uh, uh, have these physical energies called sound waves that hit my ears. And then through the sensory organs within my ears, I can detect that, those sounds, right? Those are sensations. But then the second part, right, the second thing that contributes to our experience of reality are our perceptions. So your organs can detect all of these energies in the world, but then your mind has to make sense out of those energies. So your ears can pick up sound waves, your eyes can pick up electromagnetic you know, light waves, but then your mind has to make sense out of it. It has to create some sort of meaningful pattern or has to recognize some sort of meaningful pattern out of those things and go, oh, that person is asking me a question, right? That's what those sound waves mean. Or look, there's a car coming towards me. That's what those light waves mean, right? That's perception. So based upon our discussion next of sensation and perception, uh, we will see that our idea, our experience of reality is faulty, right? Which means our ordinary world that's full of these perceptions, that's full of these beliefs that we have of reality, those too might be faulty. And then acknowledging that may help us leave behind our caves. Okay, let's talk about sensations first. Okay, so we know that our biology is limited or limits us from experiencing certain aspects of the world. 
right? That because of our biology, there are certain things around us in reality that we just can't experience, right? What we can experience are referred to as perceptual features. And there's some creatures on the earth that can experience perceptual features that we can't experience. I mean, think about how dogs can smell things that you can't or how some creatures like dogs can hear things that we can't, right? So our biology limits us. So the first key idea is that there is a, there's a reality here and we have limited access to it. So we can't necessarily experience reality as it is. We can only really experience reality as our biology allows us to experience it, which means that our experience of reality is limited. It's not complete. I mean, just think about the visible light spectrum, right? So here all around us are electromagnetic waves, but we can't experience all of them. The only ones that we can really experience are the electromagnetic waves that fall within the small bandwidth called visible light. So we can see the visible light electromagnetic waves. But there's way more than that here in where, whatever room you're in, right? There's microwaves, there's radio waves, there's ultraviolet waves. There's all these other waves all around you, but you just don't have the biology to experience them. Right? We just don't. I mean, think about some of us and our vision and how all of us have different, you know, qualities of vision. This is a typical uh, color blind chart to test people to, to see whether or not they're blind to certain colors. Some of us have a biology that prevents us from experiencing certain colors. So oftentimes, if you went to an optometrist to have a colorblind blindness test, you'll see something like this, and they'll ask you to tell them if you can see a number within a certain circle on the chart. So if you take a look at the top left circle, you might say to yourself, okay, I see the number 12. Okay, and how about the, the, the circle to its right? Right, circle, you know, box number two. Do you see a number there? Well, you might see the number eight. And as you go through, if there is a circle with a number and you just can't see it, it could be an indication that you are blind to a certain color, that there's a certain part of life, of reality, that you just can't physically experience. Now, don't freak out if you there's certain boxes here, certain circles here where you can't see a number. Uh, it, it could just be the quality of this image. So don't freak out. Go ahead and talk to optometrist if you feel, feel like you need to do a real check. Okay, But the point is the same. Our biology limits us to what we can experience. I mean, if you take a look at frogs, there's an interesting phenomena where um, evolutionarily speaking, their biology limits their access to what they experience as being food. So... Uh, think about what frogs eat. Frogs eat flies. And um, what do flies do? Well, it's in the name, right? They fly around. So what's interesting is if you had a frog surrounded by a bunch of dead flies, it would have difficulty finding food, even though it eats flies. Well, why? Because it's been biologically wired to experience food as something that moves, right? So they can't experience the food that's all around them, the dead flies. Okay, the second thing about sensations is that we, when we experience the world through our sensations, we don't experience it directly into our sensory organs. What occurs is that these different energies hit our sensory organs, like our eyes and our ears, and then those organs convert those energies into electrical impulses. So if you're staring at a computer screen right now, and there's light from the computer going into your eye, all of that information that's hitting your eye is not getting straight into your brain. Your eye converts what you think you see, all this light that's in front of you, your eye converts it into electrical impulses, and those impulses get sent through your, neuro, uh, through your nervous system up to your brain. So your brain never gets direct experiences of what's around you, right? Your brain never has an unfiltered experience of reality. 
what your brain gets is just electrical impulses, which means, you know, if you flick on and off your light switch, I mean, there's, a, there's an electrical impulse that is going through your nervous system and that's what's sent to your brain, right? Your computer that you're looking at right now, that's not sent to your brain, right? The, the words coming out of my mouth, that sound, that sound, that those sound waves are not being sent to your brain. The only thing your brain ever gets is electricity. Right? It's the electricity or the electrical waves that your eyes, your ears, your skin, your mouth, your nose send to it. So the second key idea is that our world is filtered. It's never a direct experience. So how can you really know what reality is like if you never get to really experience it directly? Third thing to think about with regards to sensation the selective attention. Okay. And the idea is that, you know, we can be aware of something. So right now I'm hoping you're aware of what I'm saying, but we are limited on what we can be aware of at any given moment, right? Because there's so many things around you right now to be aware of that you have to limit what you are aware of. You can't be aware of everything or else you go, you'll, you'll go mad, right? You could, you, your mind is designed, your body is designed to only be aware of certain things at a, in, in a certain moment in time. But what you, be, what you are uh, aware of, the things that you decide to be aware of, can be selective. Meaning as you grow up, depending on how you grew up, there are certain things that you may pay more attention to than other things. Can you think of any example of that? Certain things that you pay more attention to that, that make you focus on them, despite the fact that there are lots of stimulus around you. And think about when you're uh, think about when you're at a party, and then you somebody calls your name from across the room. Noisy party, lots of people, lots of colors, right? Lots of sensations. But when somebody calls your name, you directly or you immediately pay attention to where your name was being called, right? Because you were conditioned to pay attention to that. Or if somebody yells fire all of a sudden at the party, right? You've been conditioned to pay attention to that. And all of a sudden, your attention is placed on that. Well, think about how that limits your experience of reality. If at any moment in time, you're only focused or only paying attention to what you've been conditioned to pay attention to, and you were brought up by your parents or by media or by your teachers to only pay attention to certain things, how that limits your access to all this other stuff that's in the world. Can you relate that to the shadow and cave allegory from Plato. If you're only taught to pay attention to the shadows, why would you ever turn around and look for something else? Right? You're blind to the rest of reality as a result. Can you think how that's related to creativity and creative blocks, perhaps? So our third key idea, our sense of the world is based off of what we are conditioned to pay attention to. Conditioned to pay attention to. Let's do a quick test or um, here call test. Yeah, let's do a quick test to get a sense for this, right? An embodied sense for this. I'm going to provide you, give to you what's referred to as a Stroop test. Okay, so I'm going to give you a series of words on the screen. And all I want you to do is just read the words. Okay. And if you can pause the video while you read them, that's even better. But um, uh, it won't take you too long to read them. So let's see. Okay, so read the following words. Okay, any problems reading those words? All right. I'm going to give you another set of words. And what I want you to do is different this time. With the next set of words, I want you to identify the color for the font for each of the words. Right? The color of the font for each of the words. Ready? Identify the color for each of these words. If you're like most of us, you stumbled through this exercise, identifying the color of the font more than reading the word, right? So why the difficulty? Because you can obviously identify the color for these words. You can, you can probably easily identify the color of the font for these words. But why the delay? Why the stumbling? Well, think about what we just talked about with selective attention. Think about how you grow up, and when you were growing up, 
and you were given letters and words, what were you conditioned to pay attention to? Well, you're conditioned to pay attention to what the letters spelled, right? You're conditioned to pay attention to what the word is. You can obviously identify the color of the font, but that's not what you were conditioned to pay attention to. And that little delay, that little stagger, can you feel that? Can you feel the pull of that ordinary world, making it hard for you to leave it behind? Can you relate that to creativity in general? I mean, think about anything that your teachers or your society, your culture, your parents have taught you to pay attention to and how that might blind you from alternatives and other approaches and other ways of looking at something. Remember, we define creative blocks as not having access to deeper senses of meaning, right? From being limited to a narrow point of view. Well, selective attention and how you grew up to pay attention to certain things that might play a part into why you have creative blocks. I mean, think about if you were a kid growing up and your teachers or parents always told you to color within the lines. So when you're looking at a good, you know, a drawing or a good painting, you're, you're only worried about the colors within certain lines. And if that's all you pay attention to, you don't realize you can explore past the lines. Or think about parents who may mean very well, right, have good intentions, but they tell you to be afraid, to be worried, to be careful. And then what do you focus on? Well, you focus on the problems that could happen. You focus on the, the, the pitfalls that could occur. You focus on uh, how this could cause you harm instead of focusing on you know, where this could lead you, the positive rewards that could happen when you try to do something different. Right. So just to refresh your memory, the big idea in terms of our experience of reality is that, you know, we experience reality based on how we are unconsciously conditioned to experience it, whether it's because our biology limits our access to reality, because our biology doesn't give us a direct access to reality, because our biology causes us to focus on, on certain aspects of reality. We don't get to see all of reality for as it is. That's the issue with sensation, right? But I also had you watch this um, a short documentary clip about this young man who is unable to see, right? He lost his sight and he was able to still live in the world and do things that you know, typically would be difficult for most of us if we lost our sight. Right? He was able to play basketball. He was able to go rollerblading on his um, sidewalk and in the streets. Right? How is it that he could lose one of his senses, his sight, yet still navigate the world? I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really different way of functioning. So what happened? How is he able to do that? Play basketball and rollerblade without his use of sight. Man, imagine yourself if you lost your sight trying to do those things, how disorienting it would be. You might say, well, you know what? He, he paid more attention to certain things, right? He paid more attention to certain sounds. And then he would be able to notice when a car would come and to get out of the street. He would notice what the sound of the ball would be when it hit the backboard. Or he would notice the sound of the wind and how it would be a little bit different when it hits the, the basket, right? And that gave him a mental picture. But notice, it's not just that his sensations changed and he focused on certain things, but that he formed mental pictures differently than the rest of us. We could hear the same thing, but our perception doesn't go into forming a mental picture of it. So in addition to sensations, seemingly, what's really important then is our perception, how we make sense out of what we hear. So how do our perceptions work? Well, let's take a look at a few images that you may have seen from your textbook to get a sense for how perceptions work. Okay, here are two circles, circle one and circle two, and don't cheat, don't put any sort of ruler onto the screen. Which circle seems to be bigger to you? Is it circle one? Is it circle two? Or do you think they're the same size? Okay, so usually in class, we'll have uh, a few hands that say the same size and a majority of hands say circle two is bigger. In this case, circle two is definitely bigger. 
And the question I always ask is, why would anybody raise their hand to say that they're both the same size? Right? Think about that. Why would anybody? Because I bet you, if you said, no, I think they're the same size, I bet you, to your eyes, you know that your eyes tell you two is bigger. So what's going on there? Well, it's probably because you had expectations about what, what I was trying to do, right? You probably had a story in your head about what that exercise was, was about, and that influenced how you saw this. Interesting. And this is from the, straight from the textbook, right? Two lines here that I want you to pay attention to. Take a look at A to B, that line. Take a look at line B to C. Okay, which line looks longer? Well, I mean, if you remember, well, if you remember from the first time you looked at this, line A to B appears much longer, right? But the truth is, if you were to take a ruler right now to the screen, A to B is actually the same size as B to C, though here our perception fools us. Again, from the textbook, take a look at lines one and lines two. Which line appears longer to you? You know, traditionally, most people say one. Line one definitely appears longer. But if you remember from the reading, and if, we're, if you want to take a ruler right now to the screen, right, lines one and two are the exact same length. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, it turns out our perceptions, a lot of them at least, are based upon snap judgments that come from context, right? Snap judges, meaning we come to the judgment quickly. We don't really think or overanalyze. We don't take careful inspection. It's a snap judgment. And we're able to do that based upon the context of what's around something. So if we take a look at line A to B, the way that it's framed, what's around it, makes A to B look longer than B to C because of what's around B to C. If you take a look at the two vertical lines, because of the different ends for each of the lines, right? The ends form a certain context to make one line look longer than the other line. So we've developed as a species to make quick judgments based upon clues in our environment, based upon contextual clues. For instance, if you take a look at this image, I bet you you have no problem seeing the triangle, right? Piece of cake for you to see the triangle. Except, on closer inspection, there really is no triangle visible on the screen. What we see instead are three Pac-Men, right, angled a certain way. And then our minds fill in the gaps to say, oh, this looks like a triangle. Same thing here. I bet you nobody has a problem seeing the spiked ball here. But upon closer inspection, you'll notice that there is no ball there. All there are are spiked cones, right, on a white screen. And there's no indication, no lines indicating there's any ball there. It's just that the way the cones are arranged gives us perceptual clues, context, right? And then we come to the judgment that that looks like a ball. Again, from the textbook, can you see the dog in the image here? Okay, take a second if you have trouble with this in the text, right? And I'll maybe help you out a little bit here. Okay, so can you see the dog here? Most of us will eventually see the dog because we're really good at making meaningful patterns or envisioning meaningful patterns out of chaos, right? This is habitual pattern recognition. We take bits and pieces of information that's around us and we can recognize them as fitting into a pattern. And then we go, oh, I recognize that pattern as something I've experienced before. So with the Pac-Man, it all is facing a certain direction, which gives us an image that reminds us of what we've seen of triangles in the past. With the various dots in the other image, yeah, we can recognize the pattern and, and it re reminds us of, of a dog, what we know of dogs. I mean, if we've never seen triangles, if we've never seen dogs, both of these would, would pretty much, both of these images wouldn't cause the same sort of perception in us. And the reason why we're so quick to make that judgment, to make that conclusion that it's a, it's a, it's a triangle or it's a dog, the, so the reason why we're so good at recognizing patterns is because we are wired to know reality as soon as possible, or at least we're wired to think we know reality as soon as possible. Right? It's a survival mechanism. If you're out in the wild, 
you don't want to experience chaos. You want to know what's here. You want to know whether or not you should run away from something or go towards it because it's edible, right? We want to know something now, which means we quickly assign meaning based on past experience. It's based upon what we've experienced before, right? Another way of thinking about it is it's the unconscious assumed story of best fit. So you, you're given a bunch of random dots and we want to know what it is. We just have a natural instinct to, to know what, what's this chaos that's in front of us. And the story of best fit would be one of a dog. Can you relate this to the, to the puzzles we've looked at in our text? Can you relate this to the ordinary world and how it might be good to make quick assumptions about something based upon perceptual, conceptual, contextual clues? But can you see how we can be mistaken easily? Can you see how we can be misled easily? Because we don't necessarily think carefully or analyze things carefully before we come to a judgment. Okay. In the text, we, there, I talk about this story of a researcher who goes out to study pygmies. Right? So pygmies are indigenous people that live in these dense forests. And the researcher thought it'd be interesting for a pygmy to go on a jeep ride you know, with him out of the forest because, you know, they hadn't experienced Jeeps before. So he takes a pygmy, goes onto the Jeep and drives away from the forest. Pygmy's having a good time. And then all of a sudden, pygmy starts freaking out, getting very scared. And the researcher's wondering, well, what's going on? Why is he so scared? Is the car going too fast? Or he asks the pygmy, why, why, are, you, why, why, why are you so anxious? Why are you so scared? And the pygmy says, well, don't you see those big flies, those magical flies? And the research is like, magical flies? I don't see any magical flies. And he's staring right at the windshield going, I, I can't, I don't see any magical The pygmy's like, don't you see it right there? He's like pointing right there. Don't you see the magical flies? What do you think was happening? What was going on? Well, here's a pygmy who grows up in the dense forest. So their ordinary world is based upon that experience, right? They're driving in a Jeep away from the forest towards plains, right, grassland, and he sees these dots on the windshield. And then over time, as they continue to drive, these dots increase in size. They were headed towards Buffalo. So far away, it looks like dots on the windshield to the pygmy, right? And as they get closer, the dot seems to grow. The, uh, the ordinary world of the pygmy, right? dictates that the story of best fit was magical flies because that, that looked like a fly that was growing in size as they're getting closer to the buffalo. That was a story of best fit. That was the pattern, right, those dots that, as being flies that the pygmy recognized. Quick judgment based upon context. Because of their ordinary world, that's how they perceive their reality. So is this bad? Well, I mean, not necessarily. If I told you x times y divided by 2 equals 24 and then told you y equals 2, could you tell me what x equals? Sure you can, right? Because you recognize all of those symbols. You recognize them based on past experience and you can quickly make meaning out of this and go, okay, you know, I know. I know that I know those are variables. I know what multiplication means. I know what divide means. I know what equals means. I know what those numbers mean. So x equals 24, right? You can recognize the pattern quickly. If I give you a sequence of numbers, can you tell me what comes next? Right, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. You could probably get 32 rather quickly. And is it ever good to recognize a pattern and where it's going? Sure. It's good to recognize where something is going because that helps you predict the future, to get ready for it, right? How about if I gave you this scenario? Mary and Joe are both leaving at the same time to go from San Francisco to San Jose. Joe is riding his bicycle. Mary is taking her new sports car. Assuming no traffic, <laughs> assuming no traffic, who's more likely to get to San Jose first? Well, I mean, think about it this way. If you're trying to get from San Francisco to San Jose, what would you do if you want to get there as quickly as possible? Would you ride your bike or take your car? I mean, you know to take your car because of past experience. You don't have to overthink this. You don't have to overanalyze this. You don't have to do any studies based off past experience. You can quickly see that, hey, I should take my car. 
So pattern recognition is good. The ability to make meaning out of chaos, good, because it makes us efficient thinkers, right? Expertise, it gives us, if you're a computer um, repair person, you want to have lots of experience that allow you to recognize patterns in broken computers quickly so you can easily diagnose them, right? So expertise is good, right? This is good for us so that we don't have to overthink every decision we make. I mean, ask yourself this. When you walked into your last classroom, how many of you analyzed your chair before you sat on them to make sure that they weren't broken? You didn't analyze your chair, you sat on it. Because based upon past experience, you recognize this thing called the chair and you know that it's okay to sit on, right? It's inefficient to analyze every chair before you sit on them. Or how many of you, how many of you uh, took bacterial samples of your doorknob before you walked in and out of your bedroom, right? It's too inefficient, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic now, it's too inefficient to do that. You have to recognize the pattern, doorknob for turning, walking in, and you, you don't have time to question and overanalyze and think carefully, right? Get all the data before making a choice. No, no, you, uh, we would, if we collected all the data before making a choice, we would never make a choice <laughs> because there's too much data to collect. But the problem with being an expert, the problem with having expertise is that you can start to have a narrow sense of reality. I mean, not too long ago, we thought we were the center of the universe. And in fact, we thought we had evidence for that. Can you think of what evidence we had? I mean, just go outside. You'll just look at the sky. You'll see things going around you, right? You'll see the moon coming around. you see the sun going around you. You see the clouds moving around you. It felt as if we were the center. Not too long ago, in fact, some people even today still think the earth is flat. And they'll point to evidence for this. Why? Where's the evidence? Just walk outside. I don't see a curved planet, <laughs> right? This is Harry Warner. You remember Harry Warner? Or the name Warner from the Warner Brothers, the big movie production studio? Okay, so they started very early in films where they had silent films. Actors would go around doing activity and there'd be music in the background, right? No talking. He famously said, who wants to hear actors talk? The music, that's the big plus about this. Can you think of how narrow Harry Warner's reality was? If we stuck to his view of reality, we wouldn't have pictures with, we'd have, we wouldn't have movies with dialogue in it, right? Where people were acting and talking to each other. All of these are indicative of an ordinary world based upon what people felt were like absolute truths. So the problem with being expert, right, is that you can often tend to have a very narrow sense of reality, a narrow sense of possibilities, limit yourself to your access to solutions and new ideas. This is one of the problems with the ordinary world. You develop skills and habits to allow you to do things well, to be efficient, in the world, but then maybe you get stuck not realizing there's alternatives for you. So it makes no wonder why we can get stuck in creative blocks, right? Looking at a blank page and only thinking our reality is a blank page or, all, or, or trying to uh, create a new song and all you hear is your old music, right? It's part of the ordinary world to get caught up in certain perceptions and modes of living in the world. And so it's no wonder we get stuck every once in a while, which is why it's no wonder many of us had problems with this puzzle when we first looked at the textbook, right? Because it's so hard for us to get beyond our ordinary perceptions of 1990 and 2010, all because of the things we've just looked at, right? Our perception right, is conditioned into us by past experience. How many times have you associated 1990 with a hospital room number? Probably not so often. But because of the context, a man is born in 1990 and dies in 2010, that context, our mind automatically makes a snap judgment saying, okay, those are years. Because that makes us efficient at thinking about things. It makes us quick to think about something. But notice we can then be mistaken about it. Right? So the big idea, again, unconsciously conditioned by past experience to see the world a certain way. Think about how that narrows our ability to be creative if we only see the world a certain way. 
because of the cave you've been trapped in. Let me show you how very well you've been conditioned, by the way. One of the things that you were conditioned to do when you're growing up, as we talked about a little bit earlier, is to read. You're able to see letters and make sense out of the letters. I'm going to give you um, a bunch of letters. Can you tell me what they say? Okay, let's take a second. Read this. I bet you had no problem making sense out of this, right? In your mind, you were able to take the letters and you probably said to yourself what this means is according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place, et cetera, et cetera. Right? I bet you have no issue, no trouble making sense out of those letters. But re also realize that that's not what this says. Right? That because of habitual pattern recognition, because you're so good at making snap judgments, you neglected maybe to acknowledge the fact that it does not say that at all. Now, think about how often then we can get misled in, you know, in, our, in our lives to believe things, to believe falsities, to see the world in ways that maybe aren't indicative of how reality is whether it's about how to raise your family, dealing with your parents, dealing with your kids, dealing with your job, how to make money, how to be successful, how to make good painting, how we can easily have a misperception about those things and still feel as if we're really right. Think about conflicts people have, right? Conflicts with regards to racism or sexism or any sort of isms and how a lot of those things stem from habitual pattern recognition. Right? These sorts of people are like all like this. Those sorts of people are all like this. That's habitual pattern recognition, coming to a quick judgment based upon context. So habitual pattern recognition can be good, but it can lead us into some places that get us stuck. Okay, so here's a scenario that we'll read together, and then we'll talk a little bit about it in a second. A man is driving his son to school, they both get into an accident, and due to the severity of the accident or the collision, the man dies. Uh, the son is also severely wounded and is rushed to the hospital. When he arrives for emergency surgery, the doctor says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. Wait, wait what a minute? Wait, wait, how does that work? The man, a man is driving his son to school. They both get into an accident, right? And due to the severity of the collision, the man dies. The son is wounded, rushed to the hospital, and when he gets there, the doctor says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. How is that possible? Well, this became a particularly uh, a famous sort of um, thought experiment back in the 60s, 70s maybe. And if you think about the culture back in that time, and how the worldview people had about, about doctors. Um, lots of people had difficulty seeing how this was possible because of that worldview. In this scenario, right, the doctor could be the boy's mother. Um, so back in the 60s and 70s, people had a hard time seeing that because their ordinary world did not have doctors being associated with women. And even today, I bet you there are lots of you who also did not think of that possibility. Now, why not? Well, because of how we grew up, because of our culture, our ordinary world has programmed into us certain ways of looking at things, which means we have certain biases, right? Which means we, are, we have certain limitations on how we can perceive the world. Think about the perception, the limitations on perception about yourself that you might have because of how you grew up, or what you think is possible for you, or what you think you're able to achieve in life, right? Or what sorts of limitations you place on other people because of their ethnicity, or their gender, or their skin color, or their age. These are all biases that form as a result of our ordinary worlds, right? Programming us to have certain beliefs and assumptions about things. So then how do we escape? Think about this. How can we, like Truman, escape the ordinary world? Well, how does Truman do it? He does it once he starts to realize that there's something else, that there could be something more than Sea Haven. 
So remember that a lot of this programming, a lot of these, uh, these beliefs and approaches, uh, behaviors are unconscious. So we have to be aware of them, right? We have to be aware that there might be something else. You have to question and say to yourself, there might be another approach. There might be another belief. There might be another way of looking at what the good thing is here, right? Think about this with regards to your paper airplane exercise. If you had questioned what a paper airplane is supposed to look like, you may have came up with a different design. If you question what a glue stick is supposed to be used for, you may have come up with a different use of it. But it all stems from us being able to be in our ordinary worlds and first going, I don't think this is all there is. There might be something other than this. There might be another approach to the problem. There might be another way of, of doing whatever it is you are doing. Or there might be another picture that we can think about as to what this is supposed to look like. We have to first acknowledge that alternatives are possible. Your Part of your journal entry assignment for this week is to take a look at these goals that you wrote for yourself um, for these dimensions of life and describe the ordinary world for one of these, right? So for instance, if you're, if you're looking at a goal with regards to your career and you want to be in a certain position in five years, then what's your ordinary world about how to get there? What are the beliefs that you have about how to do it or what it's going to look like? What's the typical approach to it? How does everybody else get to that goal? I want you to describe the ordinary world of this, right? To get used to being aware of what the ordinary world is and how it works. So the ordinary world, here's our first aspect of the creative process because it's important. It's important to develop those habits, those skills, those, those ways of living and doing that make us efficient, right? This is good. If you're gonna make a creative piano piece, it's good to learn piano. <laughs> If you're going to be a creative writer, it's probably good to develop the skill to write the sentence, right? It allows us to do this stuff not just well, but quickly, efficiently. It also makes us feel safe, doesn't it? Living in the ordinary world, if you think back to Plato's allegory and then also to um, The Truman Show, being in the ordinary world is comfortable. It's what you're used to. It feels stable to you. Right? Once you leave behind, everything's unknown, unstable. So being there makes you feel at ease. And sometimes that's a very good place to be in your life, right? To take a, be able to take a breath and go, ah, uh, this is, I, can, I, can feel, I can feel grounded here. The issue, obviously, is that you, know, you get stuck there. You can, lack, you can lack the awareness that there's something other than this. And then you can't venture out to try something different, to create new things or to grow or to do something different with your life. So the solution, well, remember, a lot of this stuff is a result of unconscious processes. So the solution is just to be aware of that, right? To acknowledge that, hey, there might be more to the ordinary world than this. And then once you do that, then you can make the choice to leave the ordinary world behind, if you want to, to try to create something different, right? So Thomas Edison, right, the inventor of the, the light bulb, or at least the person who made it most famous, Thomas Edison was very aware of this, he was very aware of the problems of the ordinary world. And in his job interviews, he would, he would take advantage of this knowledge and do a certain test with uh, potential hirees, right? So if you're applying to a job with Thomas Edison, he might take you out to lunch and then give you some soup. If he saw you put salt in the soup without tasting it, Thomas Edison would not hire you. Why not? Why would he not hire you if you put salt in your soup without tasting it? It's because he noticed that you were stuck in your ordinary world. You made assumptions about the soup, about what it tastes like, without trying it first. And if you're going to be stuck in your ordinary world with your soup, chances are you're going to be stuck in your ordinary world when he needs you to be creative in his company. Yeah. So when we come back, in our next lecture, we'll talk about making the choice to leave the ordinary world and why some of us don't make that choice.